G'day, everyone. Welcome back to another week of, of our weekly mentoring here with Mark Safoulis. And this week, Mark, there's some exciting news because you've just released a new book, Mastering Tennis Tactics. And I wanted to try and pick your brains a little bit and dive into what that book's all about, how it started and how it can help people as well. And maybe look at some of the strategies in there. So tell me, how did how did this book start um, in terms of the, the tactical side of the game? And um, I guess what yeah, what gave you the idea to write this? Uh, yeah, it's it's been a bit of work on it to be honest, and and probably yourself and and obviously we've got Stephen as well, part of this this group that we put this all together, and um, and not to mention my wife who is um, you know, one of the ones that cleaned up my work, which I really need all the time. But uh, uh, the books come about over so long of coaching um, high level sport and um. When I got actually, the interesting story is when I actually started coaching in Australian rules football at an elite level, I, I looked at how they were analysing um, and creating game plans and I thought, geez, tennis is a long way behind. And this was about probably about 15 or 16 years ago um, and how in-depth some of their game plans were, 15, 20 pl- pages of breaking down opponents and um, and presentations and, and showing the players what it looked like to break down the team that they were playing against and I really discovered a love for for strategy and um, over the last sort of 15 years of, of tennis coaching and traveling around the world and um, and planning against so many different players, I thought it was almost about time that I put my philosophy of how I delve into this on, uh, on paper. And, um, you know, I think, you know, when I, when I started to put on paper, um, what my strategy of, of creating strategy looked like. I thought that a lot of people would be able to, um, to, to utilize that for, for their own purposes as well. So, so, the, you know, when I talk about creating strategy against players, I think, um, you know, I really looked at um, the, the, the process behind building a strategy. So um, in the book, what I've written is basically, you know, when you, when you're a coach and you're looking at play, uh, players at the other end, you want to identify who they are first and then identify who you are in particular and then how does your strengths match up against them. So I really enjoyed that sort of uh, ability to do that. So creating the book was all about, okay, well, uh, I know what I do in my own head, but how can I teach someone else how to how to create strategy first and foremost and and understanding the, the game plans and so forth. So um, it's been a, been a process to put together and... Um, but yeah, it's it's been really a rewarding one because I think giving out how I've been able to build strategy over the last fifteen years against certain players, but also not only that, but how do I build individuals to understand their own games as well um, through this book? So, so in the book, what we've got is we've got um, understanding yourself, which is categorizing yourself into what your genetics you have, um, what your strengths and weaknesses are. That identifies the game style that you currently have, and then obviously. You can then identify secondary game styles. So you've got your two sort of game styles there and then identifying how your game style matches up against other players and how do we break them down? Um, And that's been a real, uh, I guess in, in, in my field has been a really important part of giving players a uh, clear path and a clear understanding of what to do on game day and allowing them to have a really strong process about how to uh, utilize a game plan and keep themselves process orientated throughout a whole match. So in your opinion, I know there's, there's lots of different, you know, assets and, and, and fellow facets of, of tennis. Um, but if we were just looking at, at technical and tactical, how would that percentage split of importance actually look like before we dive deeper into some of the tactical side of things? Yeah, obviously it depends on the the area um, that we're dealing with in terms of the player and where the developmental side of the game actually is. But um, when you look at um, younger players, everyone has a philosophy. Um, I'm really big on building um, what I call the tactical side. It's more around perception, anticipation, um, movement, uh, ball control, and then I work technique within that. So you know, when I when people look at what's most important, I think it really depends on where you are in terms of the stage of development you're at. But um, I'm really big on the the tactical side of the game so understanding the game itself the game itself will will lend itself to to teaching the player what skill do i need for that area of the game 
instead of here's a skill, let's work on the skill. And then we look at, okay, now we use it here. But, you know, one of the, the common errors I find in coaching is that we, we try to clone players technically and we try to clone players into a style of technique, but it technique is uh, needs to be adaptable. And when we think of technique, it needs to be looked at as a skill rather than a style. And the skill needs to be able to adapt to any different um, situation of the game. So um, one of my, my big mantras is um, teach the skill, not the technique. And if I can teach the skill of, okay, in defense, the technical side looks like, you know, a little bit more um, shape on the ball. When you're in neutral, we're trying to like hit a little bit lower across the court. So we might hit through the ball a fraction more. And then when you're in offense, you're kind of really penetrating. You, you kind of understand that technique will change within that. So, you know, the tactical concept for me is what, um, what drives my technique. So tactics drive technique, not technique driving tactics. And if we can understand that side of, strategy and development what you'll find is that players will will become better players not just better looking players on the court so um i think you know when we when we have to develop an athlete i always encourage develop the athlete's game sense before technical sense and integrate the two there's no one without the other i think it's about integrating it but understanding that the game will tell us what the stroke production needs to look like and and how effective it is within the game scenario. Awesome. And let's dive into it a little bit more because I'd like to know what different game styles there are first and foremost. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Okay. So when we look back at game styles, originally we had um, your counter puncher, we had your aggressive baseliner, we had your serve and volleyer, and we had an all court play. So there were four, four distinct game styles, probably when I was growing up, um, and I'm 42 now, but um, that was sort of what what was you know identified at the time. Now we've gotten to the part where the game has become more of a power game, more of an explosive game, um, and you see the the taller base players stepping into it, and the big serving category has now jumped in. So you've got your five categories. Um, in the book, I've mentioned the five categories, but what I also mention is the fact that um, the serve and volley game style has now become more of a strategy than it has become a game style and or is a game style. So when we look at the top 100 male and female players, there's one serve and volleyer in the men's and none in the women's at the moment that is actually obviously serve volleying as a game style, whereas I think it can be used really effectively and probably more effectively um, if we look at um, serve and volley as a strategy to use at certain moments of a match as opposed to actually fully as a game style. So, you know, you've got your five categories that, that I look at um, mostly, um, but I think, um, yeah, like I said, serve volley is a strategy rather than a game style these days. And I think it's important that, you know, we understand what those game styles are. And, um, and in the book, basically yeah, what I've tried to do was I've tried to be really clear on what genetics make up each game style. So having a look at, you know, if you're five foot seven, um, as a male player, you're not going to be seen as a big server because the height of which you're coming at isn't able to penetrate the court and be able to come down into the court. You've got to hit up and over. So you, you're basically taking away the big serving game style. You can maybe serve and volley at times, but it's always going to be hard because your reach isn't going to be as, as good. Um, so you basically step into the category of counter puncher slash maybe secondary game style might be an all-court player or an aggressive baseliner. So you look at how, or we looked at how genetics play a really big factor in identifying who you are. And then obviously when you can actually understand what genetics make up each of the styles, it's very easy to look at the other end and go, okay, well, this player might be this kind of style. I need to look at how they play. I need to look at how they, they try and structure points. And then there's certain categories that we've got in there that helps us to break down each of those, those game styles. So, um, so we've looked at the five game styles. We've looked at what the genetics are. We've looked at what the strengths are. And then we've looked at how to how to then identify what the weaknesses are in each of those and break them down. So all of the game styles have certain strengths and, and weaknesses. Does it do you find it kind of working together like a, almost a rock paper scissors type thing, or are there things that each game style can do against the other four to win? How how do you see that playing out? Yeah. So um, so what I've tried to put into this um, 
this document is making sure that we understand what each style likes to do. So for example, if we think about a counterpuncher, right? Um, and you know, we think of some of the world's best counterpunchers, and you can you put in, you know, Alex Demon or you put in, you know, Leighton Hewitt back in the day. I'm talking Australian players because obviously it's a um coming from from Australia, it's really important that I, I utilize those those ones. Before you keep going, Mark, for, for anyone that doesn't know, what what is it a counterpuncher? So a counterpuncher is a count a player that um wins points by keeping the ball in play longer. They're physically more um uh, the endurance from a physical standpoint is in, is impeccable. Their speed around the court. They want the game to be played very lateral. They play back of the court. They don't possess a massive serve generally. Um, so they want to beat you by making you make more errors than they do. Um, and they'll keep the ball in a lot longer. So um, when we look at that, what they want to do is they want long points. They want lateral gain to keep the ball side to side. They want a high first serve percentage. They want you playing a lot of shots and making a lot of errors to break you down. They're quite gritty. They're quite fighters in terms of their mentality. And I'll break this down in the, in, the, in the document, but that's how they want to play. So when we look at if that's how they want to play, how do we then use what we have to not allow that to happen? So for example, if that's how they want to play, they want to play lateral, long points and first serve percentage. We look at playing more linear. So we try and keep the ball straight up and down the court. And you would have seen... Many years ago, this came to fruition when Robin Soderling actually played against um, Rafa Nadal and he actually played on clay and he played him straight through the middle of the court. And everyone was like, what's going on here? And he actually created a blueprint for how do you play guys that want to play the game lateral? And he basically played through the middle of the court, breaking down Rafa in that match. Now, the, the middle of the court, when people say, oh, but if I hit down the middle, my opponent will take control of the point. They will if you hit short, slow, and give them time. But if you play penetrating balls through the court, what's going to happen is you actually take away the amount of angle that the counterpuncher can play. Now, if a counterpuncher wants angle, they need angle to be able to play angle. So you take the angle away from the game, you play more straight up and down the court, and when they give you a ball that gives you time and space, that's when you spread the court and put them into defense because then you're in an offensive situation to take control. So it's like when I look at how do we break down players and it's actually interesting breaking down Andy Murray was almost the, the same when I created a strategy based around how do we break him down. Um, he's the most incredible player lateral of the court. Like, you know, you play Andy lateral and you make, you know, you allow him to play this game and stay in the point longer than you, you're in big trouble. So you almost have to be the first one to um, take control of the point. You play through the middle. You um, pull the trigger down the line when he gets in that backhand corner because you know he's not going to miss out of that backhand corner. You make sure you go down the line and force him into the ad, uh, sorry into the juice side and make sure he's playing from the juice side of the court uh, and not allow him to sort of just get stuck in this lateral game because he's going to outgrind you. He's going to outwork you. He's physically better than than most players. So, you know, when we look at examples like that. Um, and, and I've put this template together because yes, it's a very generic way to look at it. And every individual player you play against will be different, but there's very strong commonalities with every game plan that we've put together over the last 15 years against the world's best when you categorize them into game styles. And that counterpuncher one's a really prime example of that because you can actually understand what they want to do and you have to take them away from what they want to do. Um, and the two words I use when I do a game plan is um, what do we need to manage and how do we exploit? So manage means we know they're really good back of the court, control the ball. They want to stay in long rallies. They're really fit. So we've got to manage that. And how do we exploit them is we don't allow them to get into that. We go through the middle. We take control of the middle of the court and then spread when we're in offense, as well as maybe look at their second serve as a weaker part of the game, as well as possibly looking at bringing them forward. They don't like to do that either. So there's a couple of areas you can exploit. And then a couple of areas you might need to manage and make sure that they don't get in control with their strengths either. So yeah, hopefully it gives you a bit of an example of what, you know, one of the game plans might look like. So does the book go in detail on all of the different game styles and how they would play against the other game styles? Am I right in, in asking that? Yeah. So basically with the, the start of the book is in depth of each of the styles of game and what they like to do. And then in the middle to the back of the book, what I talk a little bit about is, um, with this game style, if you're a counterpuncher, here's how you break down an aggressive baseline. Here's how you break down a certain volume. Here's how you break down. And it kind of has, has those templates in there as well. Um, 
and it's put into the categories of manage and exploit as well. Where do we have to manage this this style? And then where can we exploit this style? Now, the challenge is always the question I get is how do I how do I know who I'm playing against? Well, basically, the first three or four games of any match that you play should be about working out the style of game that your opponent wants to play. Now, um, I use the 80-20 rule all the time. So 80% of the, the game plan should be based around my strengths and 20% should be based around exploiting the opponent. So, you know, let, let's use Rafa for an example. We all know Rafa Nadal. Rafa, you know, is an unbelievable baseliner, loves to use his forehand, hit heavy, push it up to your backhand side, gets you up above your backhand and dominate through the forehand wing. He uses his slice serve to open up the court, et cetera, right? Now, when Rafa plays Roger Federer, um, you're not going to see Rafa go, oh, it's not really working. I'll serve and volley now. Right, He doesn't just change his whole game based upon the opponent. He might tweak it and might change into a secondary style maybe. He might try and change the corner he plays from. He might try and change the trajectory of his ball. But his style of game is his style of game. right? So he kind of might mix up his server fraction more, but he still has that slider he's going to use. So when we look at um, you know, the 80-20 rule, if you can think of the first four games... I'm going to focus in on what I do really well. I'm going to play to my strengths. And in that same time, I'm going to look at what my opponent is doing consistently to try and break me down or what they're trying to do across the match. And if I can start to identify that within two, three, four games, then I can start to formulate a plan against the person that's at the, at the other end, um, utilizing some of the templates we've gotten that in the book. But also the templates are also a, a guide, but then you look at, okay, well, this player has a much better backhand. They do forehand. So if I'm going to exploit them, I'm going to have to exploit their forehand, break that down, uh, et cetera. The other thing I think to take into account, and I've mentioned in the book as well a little bit, but the main one of the main things around breaking down anyone's strokes, and it depends on the level of play you're playing against, um, is if you can identify their strength and break down the strength early in the rally. So for example, if someone has a weapon as a forehand and they're serving at you, Sometimes it's important to go big towards the forehand first, then exploit the weaker side after that. As opposed to going to the to the weaker side first, they get into a rally, then they get control of the point and they use their forehand. You actually might want to go to the forehand early in the rally. And the data does tell us that if you go to that shot earlier in the rally, it does break down rather than giving them time and space to be able to use that, that strength. So... Um, you know, I think there's a there's a lot of stuff to look at when you're strategizing. And I think strategy is, I think it's under under coached. I think it's undersold. And I think we need to utilize um, thinking the strategically to allow players to stay present when they're when they're playing. And it gives a little bit of a, a pathway for athletes to continue on if they understand this strategy. This strategy stuff is awesome to me because you're right. Like I, I never hear anyone really talking about it much, but it's a huge part of the game clearly. So um, I want to dive a little bit more into it. Obviously I could pick your brains all day about it, but is there a, a particular style of, of game style that you think, okay, if I could build a, a player from scratch, um, I would build this game style. Yeah. I mean, look, in an ideal world, we want a player that can do everything right. Um, we want the Ash Barty or we want the Roger Federer that um, can can play back, can play up, up the court, can have a really nice serve. Um, I mean, if you look at the players on tour now, I mean, if you could crystal ball a player to be a Novak Djokovic, I mean, you'd have, you know, an, an incredible player. I think that the challenge is... And, and what would you say he is? Um, I, I know yeah. you can't exactly pinpoint it for each yeah. player, but... And look, this everyone's game style is open to, to interpretation. And I, and I think when I look at Novak, when he first started, and if we go back to when he first won his slam at the Australian Open, um, he was one of the world's best counterpuncher. Um, and it's interesting that he just did not miss, you know, solid as a rock, you know, kept the ball in play, played lateral to the court, didn't come forward, didn't have the biggest serve, played an incredible counterpunching game. Um, and over the years has continued to develop his offensive style. So, you know, I, I still believe, and this is just a belief of mine, but he, he is the most incredible counterpuncher because what happens under pressure is you always revert back to what you do really well in your default game style. And when you watch him play a tie break, for example, he goes back to a counterpunching style and doesn't miss. I think over the course of seven tie breaks last year in 2023, he did not make one unforced error. 
And, and that just shows me he reverts back to whatever his strength is and his default game style. And then he has the ability to play offensive. Now, obviously he's built that over years, but you know, that's his, to me, his secondary style, but you know, when he's confident, I think he plays more offensive than he does defensive um, and, and plays a little bit more aggressive. So, you know, when you talk about building the perfect player, you want to build a player that can do everything from a skill set perspective. They can do anything from a strategy perspective in terms of up and back, forward, uh, forward and back of the baseline, up of the net. They can serve really well. Um, and you want to have players that are physically capable of, of being able to pop the ball big so they've got enough power to be able to really hurt you, but also have the ability to cover the court incredibly well. Um, so you look at male players that are six foot two, six foot three, have this ability, Novak Djokovic, you know, Rafa and Roger are all around the six one to six three mark. Um, and then you look at players on the female tour are probably about five, nine to six foot, six foot one, maybe are playing in those styles. So they can play any style of game. Um, so you want to build a player that can pretty much be adaptable to any surface, any environment, uh, against any player can be able to be a chameleon and go, okay, I'm playing this player. I need to play this style to beat them. So I think those are the sorts of things I would, or I try to do as well as a coach now is build a really holistic game. Um, and not to mention someone that can really think for themselves and problem solve. And I think the, one of the biggest downfalls in, in this era of coaching is the ability that we need to teach players that can problem solve and we need to teach players that can think for themselves and make unbelievable decisions under extreme stress. And if we can create players that can do that and understand the game, like we go back to the first question you asked me, understand the game first, then you understand what skills you need for those moments as opposed to you know your skills, but then the game, the game um, situation arises and you actually don't know what to do because you've never been taught the game first, you've been taught the skill first. So I'm always going back to that as um, my, I guess, a default coaching is teach players to understand the game, teach players to problem solve, teach players to be able to make great decisions. And if we can get all that encompassed into our athletes, we've got players that can play all over the world against any player at any time, anywhere, and any any conditions. So, um, you know, that's probably the way that I try and do it now. Yes, and I want to get into a couple more examples of the game styles coming up against each other. And in the book, I see you use Yannick Sinner as the prime example of an aggressive baseliner. He's obviously one of the best players in the world at the moment. What would you see as the keys to, to beating a player like Sinner, an aggressive baseliner? Well, it's interesting. I used the example of the Australian Open final this year and, and watching Yannick up close and seeing how aggressive he does play. And uh, I actually commentated a few of his matches throughout the Australian Open. And one of the comments I did make, if you get on top of him early in a match uh, where he hasn't found his range and rhythm, you can actually get some really cheap points from him. And that's what happened in the Australian Open final where he was um, first two sets. He was literally all over the place, you know, making a lot of errors, you know, going for shots he shouldn't be going for. It was a bit of obviously the pressure and the, and the moment. Um, but what he actually did in the third set was he pulled back the margins a fraction. Um, he didn't go passive. He just pulled the margins in, created a little bit more space for his ball um, and almost became an aggressive counterpuncher. So, you know, he started to make more balls. He started to, to last longer in the rallies. Knowing Medvedev had played so many um, five setters and long matches, he just out, you know, out grinded him really in the end and started to get on top and noticed that obviously the longer rallies were hurting Medvedev, he was hurting physically. So he was sort of on top in that situation. So he didn't quite change his style, but he pulled back a little bit from what he was doing early on in the match. Um, now to play, you know, aggressive baseliners, and we think of Sinner as an aggressive baseliner from the women's game, a Sabalenka and a Ribikina or um, a, a amazing at the, across the back of the court in terms of their big, big serve, big ball, and they can penetrate. But what you what you look at with them is they'll have weaknesses as well. So an aggressive baseliner wants to be able to set their feet and plant their feet. What I try and talk about with my um, players around playing these sorts of players is keep them off balance. Don't allow them to set up and be able to get their body weight behind the ball. Make sure they're on the move. Make sure they're guessing. Make sure they're, they're correct where you're creating width. So when we talk about playing against a counterpuncher versus an aggressive baseliner, counterpuncher, you want to go down the middle of the court and not allow uh, the, the angles and the width, whereas an aggressive baseliner, you actually want to create a little bit more width in the game. So if you create width in the game, you keep them off balance, they can't penetrate the court as much as what they would normally do when their feet are planted. 
So that's the first thing that I probably look at. The second thing is, if you do get a look at a second serve against an aggressive baseliner, you've got to go. That's a moment for you where you can't wait and and you know play passive on it because if you give them the first strike in the rally, they're going to take control. So it's the ability for for you to neutralize what the aggressive baseline is trying to do, keep them behind the baseline, keep them out of an offensive zone and make sure they're always off balance. And the moment you can do that, you get on top of them. Now, aggressive baseliners, their tendency in mindset, and we've got this in the book around how to, how to look at their mindsets, they're impatient. They don't want to hang in the rally. They don't want to stay there longer. They don't want the matches to go three sets. They want short, sharp points. They want short, sharp matches. They want to get on and off the court. So you've got to try and make sure that you drag that match out as long as you can. You create an impatience where they start making error because if they start losing confidence in their offensive game, they've got nowhere to go to. They're not going to stay in the rallies longer. They're not going to pull it back a little bit. They just want to keep going. So you have to make sure you get on top of them early in that situation. Now, having read the book myself, and I'm sure a lot of people might be thinking the same thing is, okay, all of this information is awesome. You know, five different game styles, how to beat each other, but how does it apply to me and how do I find my own game style? Yeah, I I put a checklist together in the book because that is a great question, Connor. And I think it's a a question that commonly comes up is, how do I know who I am um, and what what do I do really well? Like in, in myself, I kind of, understand what I do good kind of like I feel it but when someone watches you they'll be able to help so you get an expert opinion on that um like I do a lot of work with players all over the world online and and I just tell them to show me a video of them play just not not practicing I want to see you play a match so you know I get them to video a match and I watch it and I go okay geez you're really good in you know, the back part of the court, back third of the court, or you're really good, you know, in that neutral area or your your offensive game is incredibly good. Um, You know, your defense stuff is great. Okay, let's have a look at how we we mold you. How tall are you? Um, And I just kind of put it into the categories like I've done in the checklist. Um, And we look at what what are our genetics. We look at what are our strengths. We look at what are our deficiencies from a technical, tactical, physical, mental perspective. Um, And then we start to create a style of game. Right now, you know, in, I'm actually working on a new book too, Connor. It's, a, it's around how our grips influence the way we play as well. Because, you know, our grips allow us or di- disallow us to do certain things. So players with extreme Western grips are going to find it really hard to play an offensive style inside the baseline because they need time and space. Whereas players with Eastern grips or, or more flatter Eastern or semi-Western can rob the ball of speed, can take time away and can go towards the target a little bit more with their movement. So it kind of, you know, those grips will identify what we do. So that's in the works at the moment. But, you know, it just adds on to the game style stuff where you think about, um, you know, how do we how do we know who we are? Is how well do I move? How well do I move laterally? Do I want the game to be linear? Do I want the game to be angles based? Do I have a big serve? Can I work, you know, or my returns are better? And these are all the sorts of things that I've got the checklist about is you start to look at where you sit in terms of your style of game and then how do how do I categorize who I am? Because that's the most important part. For me, that's 80% of your matches who you are and the 20% is the exploit side of your opponent. But understanding who you are is the most critical part of creating game plans because you've got to play to your strengths before you play to your opponent's weaknesses first. Okay, cool. So... Correct me if I'm wrong here, but basically if I if I read the book from start to finish, I can expect to learn what the five different game styles are in depth, how they all compare against one another, what each strengths and, and weaknesses are of each game style. And, um, and then I can find out my own individual game style and then how I would beat each different game style as well. Is that is that correct? Yeah. And, it, and basically what I've tried to do is create a pretty um, in-depth look at all that. Um, And I feel, like I said before, I feel like strategy is one of the most untapped areas in tennis and in coaching. Why? Because a lot of people don't really dive into that as much. They want to teach the skills more, right? So we we end up, and and I'm not sure, like there's a lot of people that are going to watch this and every country is very, very different with with the way they coach. In Australia in particular, a lot of coaching is based upon technique. And, and the skill sets, right? So, you know, you get these wonderfully looking, beautiful stroke production players that can, you know, look amazing on the court. But, you know, it it's like a kinder surprise. You don't know what you get until you actually open the egg, right? So it, you get them into a match and you're kind of like, well, 
what's the surprise that I'm going to get in this match? I, you know, as I said before, I try to teach the game back. The game tells us what we need to do. It gives us situations, defense, neutral offense. It gives us situations in terms of both back, one at the net, one at the base, one serving, one returning. And, and coaching and teaching in scenarios allows us to um, replicate the game, replicate the situation, and learn what skills need to go within that. Whereas if we teach from the skills forward, then it's very hard to get the player to visualize when that skill needs to be used because we haven't taught them from the game. We've taught them from the skill. So it's so important to understand that, I think, first and foremost. Um, and the book hopefully goes through that in order. Well, that's kind of what I've tried to do is here's the game. Here's the game styles. Here's who you're playing against. And here's how you beat them um, with what you've got. So that's kind of the, the process I've gone with. Um, and there's a few layers coming next, which I'm going to keep trying to provide people is um, we want to win more matches. You know, as a player, all I wanted to do was know how to win. And I didn't know how to win because I didn't know who I was and I didn't know who my opponent was because I was never taught that. What I was taught was how to hit the ball, right? Um, and, you know, the difference between good players and great players is the fact that great players know how to hit the ball. They know where to hit the ball, when to hit it, how hard to hit it, how much spin to put on it, how deep to hit it, where to put my opponent when they don't like it. And they kind of understand the, that depth of the game. So that's what I've tried to, to do is, and I'm going to continue to try to do is educate on the game itself. Cause that for me was my biggest downfall. And I'm, um, you know, obviously pretty putting myself in a vulnerable situation to say that, you know, I, I didn't reach the heights I wanted to as a player. And, um, and I know that this is an area of my game that I wish I had known as a player to be able to implement. And I want my players to never have to get to my age and think, what if, you know, what if I was taught that? What if I knew that? Well, I want to make sure I give everything to my athletes to ensure that they understand themselves and they understand what they can do from what they've got to who they're playing against. So yeah, and that's kind of what I've tried to do with the whole book. Um, pop any questions that anyone has in the, in the chat room below. Um, reach out to us anytime at the tennis menu. And um, I'm going to drop in a link to um, to get this book in the chat. Mark, you did a, a tennis summit this week and there's still a little discount code from that that people can use, isn't there? Yeah. What's what's that one? Yeah, so you can use TM Summit. So I'll put it into the, um, into the group chat. So it's TM Summit 30. Um, and yeah, it's a 30% discount off the book, which is online. Uh, it's an online copy of that. So yeah, feel free to jump in. It's in the chat room now. Um, yeah, feel free to use that. We've, um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Like I did the summit this week, um, with tennis files. So if you haven't had a chance to have a look at that, um, the summit is, I think over 40 coaches jumped on and, and did a free summit, which was all live, but you can also get an all access pass. I think Connor, you might have some of those passes available maybe if anyone wants that to to, to grab hold of one of those but um yeah did the summit and i think it was over five thousand people um tuned into the to the summit which was great and yeah we spoke a lot about the strategy side of the game which i thought like we've done today is yeah understanding how we break down um different players and and when we look at data and i'm doing a lot on data as well um in this field is when we look at matches, the average amount of points that someone wins to win a match is about between 52 to 54%, um, which I think is, is a very small margin. And if we're looking at, you know, between, say, eight to 10 points a match difference between winning and losing, uh, sometimes when you understand your strategy and what you can do to break someone down, that might be the difference between you winning and losing that match. So, you know, I like to to be able to utilize um, strategy to keep us mind our mindset present and to keep us in it in the game, but also to be able to have a really clear path of what I'm trying to do. Um, and the one thing that I uh, um, hear a lot about and doing coach education, which I've done for a long time, Connor around the world is um, when we talk about or to our kids around, okay, um, just stay process driven. And I hear this all the time by coaches stay process driven. Now, process driven needs to be clear. What, is the, what does the kid know about their process? What is their process? And for me, it's my style of game is I'm a counter puncher. I want to lengthen the rallies out, high first serve percentage, keep the game lateral, work the ball high and heavy over the net to be able to get clearance, 
keep the ball in play, make them make errors, um, et cetera, right? So that's my process. But how many of our students that we coach or, you know, you've got a child that plays tennis, how, how many of them actually know what their process is? You know, we can say be process driven, but what is the process? Um, and, and by putting this together, this book, what I, I hope to achieve was people understood who they are more clear and understood their process a lot clearer than, than basically what before they read the book. So it's just creating clarity around who you are and, and what you need to do on the court. And that's, that becomes your process. Yeah. And I was going to say earlier, just before I cut out, I seriously, I've, I've read this whole book and I couldn't recommend it more as someone myself. I'm not anywhere near a professional tennis player. I'm a, a casual fan of the game, but I actually learned so much reading the book and, and it was awesome. Um, so grab your, grab your copy. Uh, the link's in the chat room below. And I, I'm also going to drop a link to your speech at the tennis summit um, last weekend as well. And anyone who wants to go back and watch that can, can go and see that. Um, I would love to talk to you about it more, Mark. We're out of time for this week, but we're going to be back um, online and at around the same time, probably around the same day as well next week, um, whether it's, it's Monday or Tuesday. Um, and yeah, we'll send us through questions any, any time we're happy yeah. to help. So, yeah, I think one of the big things is I want to answer the questions that people want, uh, Connor. So, you know, if there's things that you want to learn about, um, thanks, Mark, really appreciate that. Uh, if there's anything that you want to learn about, if there's anything that you'd like me to present on, um, you know, I, I, as I've always said, Connor, I started the tennis menu to help others because I knew that, you know, when I was playing, there wasn't the ability to to learn um, in this in this way, shape and form. And I always said, actually, um, I, I actually nearly left the game, Connor, about two years ago as a coach um, when I got ill. And uh, some people know the story, but I got quite ill and I thought I'm going to leave the game. And, um, and someone came up to me and said, but what happens to your 20 20- five, 30 years of IP, where does that go when you leave the game? And I actually had to stop and, and think about, um, you know, the game's given me so much and I want to give back to the game. So, um, you know, that's what Tennis Menu was was built upon and that's what I want to continue to do is to help others um, to grow and to learn the game, to love the game and hopefully the game gives back to them as much as it gave to me. And if I can do that um, through this platform, um, you know, and helping others achieve what they want to achieve then you know that's kind of my purpose in in doing this so feel free to email us info at the tennis menu um dot com you know it, anytime um you know i get back to everyone I, I pride myself on getting back to every single person i pride myself on um helping everyone and or you know you can dm us on on instagram i'll always get back to you and if there's something i can help you out with i'd love to so please feel free to reach out anytime and um, thanks so much for those who joined today, but also those who watch it um, on replay, which um, I'm getting some awesome feedback and I love that and um, love to you know continue help the people in the tennis world get better and love the game as much as I have. So um, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for jumping on today. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to next week already. Thanks a lot, guys. And we'll be sending out an email um, with a link to next week as well and uh, with the time as well. So stay uh, stay up to date and uh keep your ears peeled we'll talk about more great stuff next week so thanks guys thanks so thanks much. guys